clearly should stop this fighting. Otherwise, we'll miss the fireworks. There won't be any fireworks. And here we go. Hi, my name is Carlos, and today we're going to be taking a look at the work of Christopher Nolan. What makes a filmmaker great? For me, it's the ability to please the audience coming out of the movie theater. And if so, then Christopher Nolan is an incredible filmmaker. Something Nolan is often famous for, however, is creating complex, challenging stories for the audience. And it's really in these challenges that I think we can find both what makes Nolan great and what could be improved. So if there's one thing I want to accomplish with this essay is that I want to identify two things. What does Christopher Nolan do to challenge his audiences, and what does he do to help them? One thing that Christopher Nolan does is use non-linear storytelling. More so in his earlier works, Nolan would employ an editing style that harkens back to Citizen Kane and Rashomon. And I think the film, to a certain extent, is a combination of that kind of material, those kind of tropes and, and um, story elements um, with some of the more experimental narrative and editing rhythms of people like Nicholas Rogue or right back to Orson Welles and people like that. His first film, Following, tells one story cut into three different parts, and then those parts are scattered throughout the film in an ascending order. So the structure of the film looks a little like this. We start with an investigation, then we go back in time. Scene one is the first scene in the movie chronologically. Scene two happens sometime after the first scene, and scene 3 happens a further period of time after the two scenes. Sounds a bit traditional, right? But what Nolan does to keep the audience asking questions is once one round of three scenes is done, he'll repeat. So the chronological structure of the movie goes something like scene 1, scene 4, scene 7, scene 2, scene 5, scene 8, scene 3, scene 6, and scene 9 until you're all but left with the ending of the story and the movie. When you're working within that genre, it actually buys you quite a lot of creative freedom to experiment narratively. Because you begin the film with a voiceover, you set up a guy in a police station talking to a cop, you know, whatever. the audience knows that you're going to get back to that. They know that they're going to get answers to certain questions. And so you're then able to take quite a few leaps, I think, in terms of um, comprehensibility or clarity for the audience. You, you're really able to experiment a bit. His second film, Memento, is told differently. Using what he learned while making Following, he heightens the subjective storytelling from the perspective of an anterograde amnesiac by telling the story backwards. In this, we the audience share the mindset of a character who literally doesn't know what's going on, making us not just sympathize with the character, but intrigued as to finding out what happened. And my solution to telling the story subjectively was to deny the audience the same information that the protagonist is denied. And my approach to doing that was to effectively tell the story backwards. That way, when we meet a character, we don't know, just like the protagonist, how he's met that person, whether he's even met that person before, or whether or not they should be trusted, that kind of thing. Lenny! The story of Memento almost unfolds in a series of three to five minute serial episodes revealing to us and to Leonard, our protagonist, the truth of his wife's murder. This style of editing also makes audience immersion and attention all the more important as well, because as Nolan said himself. Um, people often refer to Memento as having a non-linear structure, but it isn't. It's, it's very linear, more so than a conventional film. You actually can't remove a scene from the film, um, because each scene depends on its relationship with the pre preceding scene and the one that follows. It's totally linear, it's just reversed, essentially. Nolan also has two different styles of flashing back. One of them is purely for the storytelling. He'll fade to black and then back into another scene in order to progress the story that's being told. This is the type of flashback we saw in Citizen Kane, Rashomon, and Memento. Using this type of edit is essentially Nolan's way of telling the audience that he's transitioning back in time through the story. And it's useful. But he also has a different type of edit for a flashback that's much more obscure than the one he uses for advancing the storytelling. Nolan, for me, is a filmmaker that seeks to merge both mainstream and more avant-garde cinema, and one such way he does this is using the emotional flashback. My wife. That's sweet. Dying. 
Many of his characters are distraught or troubled, like Leonard with his amnesia and Cobb's distress over his dead wife. And with these characters, severely complex emotions can be made understandable through his flashbacks. Rather than fading into these emotions, however, Nolan obliges to use a simple cut to show memory, or another event out of sequence. Sound familiar? Malick's influence on my work is very clear. Take this transition from the thin red line, and notice how ebbingly it flows from soldiers at Guadalcanal. I don't feel the desire. To a soldier's memories of home. This is an effect seen here in Inception, as Cobb explains to Ariadne about his wife. To become old souls thrown back into youth like that. Cuts like these heighten the subjectivity of the storytelling because it allows us to just fall back into the memory and feel the emotion as if we were in the character's head ourselves. She was possessed by an idea. Nolan is the type of filmmaker that wants to keep the audience immersed in his films, whereas many directors often seek to create jarring moments that bring the audience outside of the movie, Nolan is walking a fine line between this involvement in the movie and the metacinematic style of filmmaking, as Evan Pushak put it in his video analysis of The Prestige. I'm even going to go ahead and borrow the same quote he used, in fact, from Nolan. When talking about the differences in the Batman origin story in Batman Begins, Nolan states that, We didn't have young Bruce going to see Zorro because a character in a movie watching a movie is very different from a character in a comic book watching a movie. It brings a deconstructionist type of thing that we were trying to avoid. In essence, having a character in a movie watch a movie feels a little bit like breaking the fourth wall. And even characters simply discussing movies can often be jarring. The chances of this happening are like the chances of us making a movie. In this aspect, Nolan doesn't seek to challenge the audience, but rather to challenge himself. In order to keep the audience's attention drawn to the screen instead of the world around them, Nolan neglects a character's traditionally accepted origin and uses those smooth Terrence Malick style cuts to show emotions through memory. One might argue, however, that Nolan's use of intercutting events in non-chronological order can bring someone out of the movie-going experience. That the complexity of the storytelling in and of itself is too much for the audience to handle, causing many people to just give up in trying to understand. And so in order to maintain that half of the audience's attention, Nolan does something that probably blatantly rips the other half out of the movie. He explains too much. This is seen more and more often in his recent works than in his older films. Nolan employs characters like Ariadne in Inception that despite being interesting, are only there for the sake of the audience to understand the film's unique world. Cobb relays all the information onto her and through her to the audience and also in Interstellar, in order to keep the audience up to date with what's going on in the film, the dialogue between Cooper and Tars in the Tesseract sounds more like a thesis paper on what could be inside of a black hole, instead of two characters actually inside of one. Cooper, people couldn't build this. No, no, not yet. One day. I think that the reason Nolan does this is because he knows that he has such a wide audience, and in an attempt to appeal to everybody, his explanations just come out sort of stark and lifeless. And it's completely understandable that Nolan doesn't want to leave anybody behind, but since when did everything have to be explained? Paradox. Stanley Kubrick, another one of Nolan's huge influences, isn't scared to avoid explanation. In fact, the epic 30-minute finale of 2001 A Space Odyssey lacks a single line of dialogue. Kubrick avoids this simply by allowing the camera to tell the story from the point where Bowman enters the Stargate up to the last shot. And in turn, the ending is much more ambiguous and more immersive than that of Interstellar. Not only that, but it also lasts a lifetime longer. So what can Nolan do to avoid this infamous cinema of explanation he's known for? Well, exactly what he seems to be doing. Searching for complexity in reality. His next feature film will be based on the story of the Allied invasion of Dunkirk, France in 1940 during World War II. Rather than creating another universe of multiple dimensions or dueling magicians, Nolan seems to be not necessarily toning his style down, but embracing it on a more relatable, immersive level. After all, who wouldn't want to see a movie that's being hyped as Saving Private Ryan meets The Thin Red Line meets Christopher Nolan? Even with all his faults, Nolan represents something in cinema that we so rarely see nowadays. 
His use of immersion through editing, complex storytelling, and practicality bring to mind directors from an age of cinema long gone, directors like Stanley Kubrick, Orson Welles, and Terrence Malick. And in all this, he might try to relate his films to everyone, causing an ultimate flaw, but watching his films, you can only know that there is so much more to them than almost anything else you can buy a ticket for. I guess that in the end, we just have to wait and see what he does next. And by the looks of it, it's probably going to be worth it. Ni le bien, 